We are. So welcome to our TAC Talk with Robert Horline in conversation with Jamie Brunson. The Taos Abstract Artist Collective, or TAC, is a group formed by myself and my partners, Aaliyah Horline and Carrie Bell back in 2020. And since then, we've been doing quite a lot in the community here in Taos, New Mexico. And we've had the delight of meeting so many different artists across Northern New Mexico and beyond truly. Um, we've ha had a, a show that was launched, our inaugural show last September, where we had um, 62 artists from Northern New Mexico abstract artists show their work. And we currently have a show up at the Taos Center for the Arts um, entitled Viewpoint Abstract Minimalism in Taos, New Mexico, curated by Hillary Nelson. That's been really exciting. We're getting ready for our fall group community show again. So stay tuned. And in the meantime, we've been doing community events, mixers, these tack talks, and a heck of a lot more behind the scenes. So just a few words about who we are and what we do. Um, the Taos Abstract Artist Collective promotes, promotes abstract artists working in or near Taos, New Mexico toward the exchange of ideas, new aesthetics, and creative concepts. Taos is synonymous with abstract thinking with origins in, in, in indigenous geom geometries, transcendental and modernist movements, and conceptual and land art installation. Once the nexus for westward bound artists, Taos unleashes expansive abstract thinkers. We represent, represented amongst our group are established mid-career and emerging artists who show in Taos or Northern New Mexico nationally and internationally. So with that, welcome officially. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you, Mark, and thank you to all of you for, for coming today. Um, what The way that this works, and again, in case you haven't tuned in before, it's a little bit different than other types of artist talks or virtual artist talks. So we are going to show a short pre-filmed uh, pre um, segment. It's about 20 minutes long that Mark Smith, our, our in-house videographer, has produced and, and has um, filmed and edited. And then we'll have an opportunity as a group here to ask some questions. So I'm gonna ask everybody to put your thinking hats on and think about any questions or things that you might be struck by um, in tuning into the, the short film, anything you'd like to ask that maybe wasn't covered. You know, uh, it's impossible to capture everything, although we try to do our best to, to get a very good slice of life. Um, and and we visit artist studios, and so that's what, what that's what we've done with this talk. So Mark had the opportunity to visit um, Bob in his studio with Jamie Brunson, and I'm going to get started. But before I do that, I want to just uh, Bob and Jamie give you an opportunity to say hello to your audience here, and and then we will we will get going. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to see some friends here. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. It's really neat to see all your faces pop up. There's people. Hi, everybody. There's people I haven't seen for a long time. And uh, oh, it's great to see you. So thanks for coming. Fantastic. Well, thank you both again. Um, so I'm going to stop my video and get the, the film set up. Everyone is muted. So please stay that way. Um, and then afterwards you can unmute yourselves and we can ask some questions. So again, think about things you might be struck by, questions that you have, and please enjoy this conversation. minimal abstract art it started in the caves and because those experiences are so basic it'll always be with us bob thank you for inviting us to your studio for another tack talk i wanted to ask you because we've talked about it before about the role that nature has played in your work i know you're a consummate outdoorsman and i think that has some bearing on the work that you do well it does and uh Jamie, I'm really glad that you could come and interview me. We've been friends for years, and uh, 
and artistic uh, buddies who share a lot of things about our work. And so, uh, welcome. Thank you. And yeah, nature, you know, I grew up in Colorado and the outdoors was a big part of my life uh, as a youngster, also athletics. And so the two kind of came together and I have quite an athletic still, quite an athletic relationship to the outdoors. Uh, I climbed most of the higher mountains up there. I went into unusual long hikes there and particularly in Wyoming. Uh, nature was always a place of, of, uh, of learning, of calming, of knowing. I just felt like I fit in. Well, you've spoken also about natural systems and what you derive from nature that appears in your work. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of natural systems and its bearing on your paintings and drawings? Sure. It, it's pretty obvious, to, at least to me, that my work is abstracted from nature. And I think I abstract it several steps, especially in the really minimal work. Uh, I started actually as a eight-year-old or 10-year-old painting landscapes and uh, became fairly proficient at that. And then when I went to art school, I decided I wanted to do abstract work, but it always tied back into my feelings about what underlies natural systems. Um, I, to, to use a, a, an analogy that I think is very descriptive, and we might come back to it a couple times here, the ocean. Like on the surface of the ocean is all of what you see. It's beautiful, it's uh, moving. You see those great surfing pictures of the light coming through the wave. But then you go to the deeper depths and it gets different. You go to deeper and deeper depths, it becomes more abstract, more basic. And my interest in art has always been to go deep in the ocean and figure out how things work and then somehow make that into uh, uh, something of art. And, uh, and I've approached it in a lot of different ways. I think there are a lot of different ways to do it. And I also don't think this is unique. I think actually most of us work that way, although some people's input would be more involving people uh, and culture. I think my in input involves nature and the, the kind of the older history of art. Like I love looking at a Rembrandt and here's the center of it. And I love the way he does the background and the, the grays and the blacks and the browns. Uh, because that's how it works and that's what makes the figure jump. But I really am less interested in the figure. Well, actually, your, your talk about older work makes me think of, I mean, historical work, makes me think about something that you said about using Renaissance space versus flat space, um, which is more typical of abstract work. So you're talking about a kind of a depth of field and a kind of visual layering. Can you, can you explain that, especially in relationship to some of the work that we're seeing right here? Yeah. Um, when I went to art school, and I think when you went to art school, you weren't supposed to depict space. Things were supposed to be, if anything, really shallow or really flat. And eh, I struggled with that right away. And I don't know, some artists think the, the ideal thing to do is, is uh, uh, do what they tell you not to do. Well, I didn't really try that, but just naturally I went for deeper space and it's exciting to me. You can see it in a lot of these things like the blue one, the deeper space and how you depict that with paint has always really fascinated me. And maybe I'm not supposed to, but I really like doing it. And, and again, it feeds into this idea of discovering how things operate. So you're doing, I think I see a strategy here where you're applying layers of gestures and marks or layers of forms. A minute ago you talked about the body not being particularly interested in the body, like the 
the physical human body, and yet there are these forms in all of your work that true, that true. are, in, in essence, they're a condensed body, like an energy body, and you've also used this phrase, let me see if I can remember it, none can exhaust the body and tangible bodies, two phrases referring to bodies, to title right. your series. So can you, can you explain the idea of the sort of energetic body or mass versus the idea of a, an actual physical body? Yeah, I think that's it right there, that if you take any system in nature, a cloud, there's an energetic body there of which the air is moving, the water vapor is doing whatever it does, the wind does, interacts with it. Uh, and, and I've taken that kind of idea of body. And uh, I think it's, it's present, even when some of my things are real spread out and quite landscapey, but it still co coalesces somewhere. I've, I've never been happy if there's nothing in there. And I tried for years. I know we talked about this before, and you've seen uh, some of my all over paintings. I tried for years to make paintings that didn't have a center of, of uh, uh, that didn't have a center. And I just decided I couldn't do it because they always kept coming back to having some kind of center. One thing I noticed in, in that archival work that you showed me, and it's, that's on your website as well, the, the flat color fields, is that you used the same kind of high key sweet palette that appears surprisingly in a lot of this work. Because in a way, I think of this work as being very kind of masculine because of the, the big, broad, energetic marks, um, the things that you call scribbles. So can you talk a little bit about your, your color choices? Um, yeah, actually, I've, I've, I've come to realize that I, did, I didn't understand what I was doing with this for a while. But then I've come to realize that there are the colors that interact in a usually kind of natural way. And then there's what I call signal colors. A signal color is something that jumps off the page and that's an exciting thing. And you can see it in, in a number of these things, things that jump out at you, which you might say is unnatural. And yet I can think of a million things in nature that jump out at you too. What kinds of things in nature is like? Well, the obvious one here in New Mexico where the sky is the most fabulous sky. I, I think it's the best in the world. And the sunset sky jumps out at you like the rest of the day, it might kind of be kind of calm and it's blue and it's white and there's these puffy clouds, but at sunset, it blasts you. Uh, of course, also uh, a lot of things about animals uh, jump right out in your face. And uh, yeah, it's, it's part of, anyway, I don't see that as being so separate from it but it doesn't blend into the natural landscape. It sort of fights against it. In fact, that's a key element to me that I've, I've talked about this thing of irritation, that sometimes I've done one thing and put an orange uh, thing next to it. The, the, uh, part of the idea is you just can't look at that thing without being distracted by that thing. And so what about, like, what about the gestures? Can you... Can you explain a little bit more about them, about how you do them? Are they, are they wrist gestures? Are they full body gestures? Um, how do you know when to stop? Uh, how do they work scaling them up and down? I mean, scale is an interesting question in your work. So scale, yeah, because I do a lot of things that are really small. And I think some of my best things are small. Uh, it's it's different, you, you know this as a painter, how different it is to do a gestural thing that big as opposed to doing it that big, because here it's like this, and here it's very physical. Um, so the, the gestural drawing, you know, it's funny, I started this way back in art school 50-ish years ago of making scribbles. I did work based on scribbles in art school, and I didn't even realize that was important to me. I just did it, and it seemed to be important. 
But now I've really, uh, the idea at first was to draw so fast enough that I couldn't overthink it. Oh. Uh, and then the second idea was to draw with my left hand because it wasn't as skillful as my right hand. Now I've, my left hand is as skillful as my right hand, so that's all kind of gone. But the idea of physical gestures and having it coalesce into a kind of space and sometimes tighter into a kind of a body is pretty basic to all of this. And it just feels right to me to do it that way. Well, I notice it's very consistent across most of your work. It uh, has become that way in recent in the last decade, yeah. And again, going back to the idea of energy, I mean, they feel very energetic. They feel, they feel like you're capturing a moment and an action. Good. Good. The, uh, the quick drawing, it, it is in the moment. You, you can't think too much. You can't, I, I can't think that fast. So I move, and some of it now I've learned also to do it slower and not think either. And because as soon as you think and, and look at it, stand back, you start making it like, oh, that should be rounded a little bit there, and they need a little more here, and it becomes different. We've talked before, and you've mentioned the idea of minimalism or reduction, and you mentioned something about it a few minutes ago. Can you say a little bit more about that, about the intent of minimalism versus the kind of reduction in those color field paintings that you did that didn't have uh, an object? Because these, to me, they look very full and animated, but again, you've talked about stripping things down or drawing things down from nature and sort of reducing them to their essence. So how does that operate in your work, that essentialism or that reduction? Actually, I th since we were talking about meditation, it's actually the same thing. What meditation does, you start up at the surface of the ocean and then you settle down, settle down, settle down into yourself and you find quieter, more basic level. And I, I think I'm doing the same thing here. I'm starting out with animals and trees and mountains and sky and all that, and then sort of sinking and letting it, it's funny, it works in you and out of you. And I think the whole learning for me over the decades has been how to, how to not obstruct that process like i'm i can find it in me yeah i'm finding it right now and then how do i put it out into the artwork uh, if we can go back to the idea of bodies and that phrase none can exhaust the body and tangible bodies i think you told me there was a, a specific was it roland barth or somebody like that it was a specific source of it, it of was that phrase? in that case but when you talk about not exhausting the body, are you talking about your own physical body? Are you talking about a general collective body? It, 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 I'm talking about all the bodies that you can't, I mean, this is what I've found when I've been working all this time, is that no matter what I do, it always coalesces into some sort of body. And, and I mean, it, other people might not call it a body, but I'm calling it a body because it's a bunch of energy all over the place and then it it's coalescing. coalesces. And so when you can't exhaust the body, what I'm really saying is you can't exhaust the idea of the body or the truth of the body or the extent or the relate, a lot of things. You, you just can't exhaust it. There's millions of them. The universe is full of celestial bodies. And they're a coalescing of energy. You see what I mean? Yes. So you look in at your atoms, and they're a coalescing of energy, and they're a body too. Do you see a relationship between that way of thinking and meditation practice? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I was, I mean, I started meditation early, but I was thinking, I did other practices before I even started meditation. I was always uh, where I wanted to go. And it was to learn about, I don't know, meditation is basically inward, but 
you get really inward and it's the same as the outward. It's all the same. I like that because my experience of meditation has been that the boundaries between inside and outside tend to dissolve and then you realize your relationship to all of that. You know, the, but the idea of boundaries is really interesting and people have been writing about the Vermeer show that's over in Europe mm -hmm. right now and I've always really looked carefully, back when you could walk right up to him, look really carefully at Vermeer's paintings and the thing that he understood is that there is no sharp boundary between your body and the world uh, and, and that no uh, border between things is distinct. It's always a little bit blurred. And funnily enough, and I've really thought about this for a long time, that makes it more real. Where if you paint a very distinct boundary, it looks unreal. And I think part of that maybe is optically that our eyes kind of see things a little bit uh, uh, boundaryless. So you're sort of talking about that atmospheric quality in his work. And also, but his bodies, his objects, like he's got this Persian rug laying over something. You look at it really closely and it's just a tiny bit blurry. Another artist that understood that completely was Gerhard Richter. And you remember oh, his right. portraits? Yes. And they were always a little blurry and it makes them more real. And not because life is blurry, but because it's the truth, is that things are not so distinct. It's not because we don't see them correctly, and it's not because I can actually see the molecules exchanging with the air, but there's some kind of deeper reality there that we all sense. And, and then when we see an artist, and I guess this has a lot to do with artistic process, when we as artists can give back something that the viewer senses, even if he doesn't know what it is, it makes it more uh, uh, profound for the viewer. I, I wanted to ask you another question about the series of work that's called Horizons. Yeah. And part of that has to do with the idea of how you've broken up the expected or anticipated picture plane and how the horizon functions in that practice and what led you to disrupt the picture plane uh, in the way that you have. This is one of my most favorite series of yours that you've- the, with, that, the tilted, with the tilted planes. Yeah, that you've, that, yeah. you've pursued for quite a while, I think. Well, one of the, there's several ways to answer that. One way is that when you experience and, and look into an, any natural system, one of the things you come up with is geometry. And because if you think of it, all nature is, is a horizon line, which is flat. And of course it's varied, but we'll, we'll generalize flat. And then energetic things like trees, people and whatnot are vertical. And the gravity is always trying to pull the vertical down and the various forces of volcanoes and whatnot are pushing it up. So that's basically all that's going on in nature. And as soon as you have a flat level line, it's a horizon. And so I started playing with that horizon and then I, the, the, the angled picture planes is something I've done for decades. And you know, we're all used to, when you have a rectangular painting or a square, <laughs> It's a window, right? It's a window. Yeah. And it's also, you don't even see it much because paintings are always rectangular. Now, as soon as you make it not rectangular, then you see it and it starts to make a round painting or an odd shape, which I did a lot early. Uh, then you really see the shape and it becomes like Ellsworth Kelly, it becomes all about the shape. Uh, and so, so anyway, I got into tipping these geometric things and having overlaying geometry like that and like those and the ones in the other room. And uh, yeah, I, I really want to do more with that. I, I feel like I've just sort of tapped the surface on that. So, so Bob, you had mentioned that you had done a series of works on paper that were 
initial studies for this, these current bodies of work. Could you show me some of the drawings and yeah. talk about them a little bit? Well, so in this piece, for example, there's the tilted plane which disrupts that window-like space. And then you talked about Renaissance space and layering in your work. And I see that the function of these dots, which might also be bodies, Maybe. Yeah. I don't think of them that way. I think of them more as the visual disruptor, like we were talking about, the idea of something that flies off the surface and is it, quite different than this is your deep space, and, and then it relates to this, which might even be seen as shallow space, and then the dots come off the surface. They really so. do. I mean, there's really a foreground and a background yeah. in this, and that's, yes, there is. that's really, it's, it's such a simple device, but it works so effectively spatially. Yeah, I can see all the, all the visual elements, again, reconfigured in a slightly yeah, this, different this way. This even has the drawing yeah. underneath and the dots and to, the gesture. to come forward. Wow. Yeah, these, see, I really, uh, looking at them, I, it makes me really want to do them like 10 feet wide, which is what I intended to do, only I had a too small a studio. But now I have a studio. Now you have the walls. I, I have seen that that large piece of yours that is in Mark Petrick's collection. Yeah. That's almost environmental. It's so big. Yeah, it's like eight oh. feet. And here's another one. The, the the idea of two squares, even if they're not tilted. And you're using that same foregrounding strategy. Yeah. So that that sits in front. This group has. That's right. Everything comes forward off the white, off the black. Uh, some of them were real minimal. And the mind wants to close the space between yeah. them or connect them somehow. Yeah, and I, I think every viewer would tangle with the geometry and it, it brings, I, I hope, brings the viewer into the, the work. Well, Bob, thank you so much for letting us come in today and talk to you. I really appreciated hearing about your work at depth. Well, thank you. And I, I feel honored that, that you could come. And I know you're a, a brilliant art thinker and I really appreciate you looking at the work and, and then talking about it and thinking about it with me. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, we're back. Um, that was wonderful. That's great. Um, thank you so much again for both of you. And we'll have, uh, I'd love to just turn it over right now, um, Bob and Jamie, for anything you'd like to say before we jump into the audience Q&A. Obviously, it's so impossible to take, you know, many, many hours of conversation and consolidate it into a short period of time. So we'll have a chance in this Q and A to cover other things that maybe we didn't cover in the video, but anything that either of you would like to just say or share about the process before we jump in? Well, I'd like to just say thank you, Mark Smith, for doing such a nice job with the video. It was really well done. Thank you. And Jamie, thanks for being there. Oh, it was my pleasure. I especially enjoyed finally getting to see your drawings. That was that was wonderful because I've. I've been to your studio a few times and seen the larger paintings in process, but to see where they came from was exceptional. And really Mark's, Mark's uh, guidance in this process, which we had not done before, was really helpful. And the edit is just beautiful. So Mark, we're, I, you're here somewhere. Thank you for that. He's in there somewhere. We're very lucky that we have an in-house videographer. I'll give everybody Mark's contact information at the end. You can check out um, his other work. And yeah, thank you both. Um, I have something else to mention, which I maybe should have mentioned at the beginning, but um, you know, some of you know this, maybe some of you do not, that Robert is um, the father of one of the founders of the Taos Abstract Artist Collective. And I would I needed to make that known to everybody, Aaliyah, um, Aaliyah, my partner, partner in, in abstract art crime here, um, 
so, so lovely to get to know more of Aaliyah's family and to get to know Robert and to see just how different your art practices and robust both of your, you know, respective art practices are. It's been a real joy on a personal level. Um, I have a couple of questions in my mind, but I do want to, uh, I guess, bounce it the ball over to the folks in the audience. So, you know, anyone who has a question, please feel free to um, raise your hand, put your um, put some uh, your question in the chat. You can use the little raise hand raising icon in Zoom. We're pretty informal here, but please feel free to jump in with a question if you have one. Um, and Mark, if you can help me also, if if I can't see folks with a question, feel free to to to, to let me know. Does anyone have a question to start us off? It's hard to be the first person to ask a question, but Tom, I can count on you to ask a question. <laughs> Jump right in. I, I don't really have a question, just co comments, many. And boy, that was rich. That was really wonderful. And uh, great to see more of your work because I haven't seen a lot of it. And it's um, it's hard to focus on, on uh, one particular thing that I would want to comment to you. But what struck me was you at one point said you were trying to work on uh, uh, paintings that don't have a center and you said it couldn't be done. Well, I, I don't mean to argue, but I think that these, um, these multiple canvases, especially the ones that are tilted and one of the last ones you showed, which was uh, two squares stacked vertically. I do think, they achieve what you were looking to do with uh, a work not having a center. Because uh, even though I think of that, the two squares stack vertically, they're almost like two separate paintings and yet they're not. First of all, because you're not presenting them as two separate paintings. But what the ultimate piece is, has to have both of those things there. But I don't think there's a center. I mean, the, the border, again, you were talking about, you know, fuzzing out borders. So these two canvases have a border where they meet. And yet that, I wouldn't even call that the center, even though it is dead center on the piece. So that's just a comment, but I'd like to hear what you think about that. Do you think you achieve that centerless in, in these, uh, the tilted canvases. I, I love all the work. It's fantastic. But there. <laughs> well, thanks, Tom. Uh, sure. Tom, sometime when you're down in Santa Fe, uh, let me know and come by and visit. And uh, I'd, I'd love to show you everything that's sitting around here. Um, it's actually an interesting thing that what I really would mostly say about the centerless painting is I didn't feel like I could do it. And yet I have pursued it even, I, I used to pursue it and think about doing it. And now I, I agree with you actually, I think I have sort of achieved it without pursuing it. Um, it's something that's in there for me. I guess, again, it probably relates to nature that, you know, you look up at a big blue sky and it's really beautiful and it's really uh, rich with uh, life. And yet, unless there's clouds or airplanes or God knows what, it's pretty centerless. And uh, so maybe, yeah, you know, that's a really interesting observation. And uh, maybe I am achieving that. Uh, good. Good for me after all this time and not even realizing it. Thank you for bringing that up. Thanks, Tom. Um, I like that idea of the centerless sky. So it's, it's a nice phrasing too, right? It's very rather poetic. Um, I see uh, a virtual hand raised. I think I see Ian's hand raised. And just so everybody, if you uh, aren't sure, you can click on the three dots next to your name and you should be able to have, raise your hand there. And then also on your Zoom screen, there's a space where it says reactions. You can raise your hand, you can give a thumbs up, you can do all kinds of fun things. So we'll bounce over to, <laughs> no thumbs down. Um, we'll bounce over to Ian first and then it looks like Fred also. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Hey, how are you? Uh, I was reading a guy, do you know the abstract painter, Brian Rutenberg? 
No. He's pretty well, I mean, he, he shows in New York, he's got big abstract paintings. And if I was just reading what he was saying is that there isn't very high chroma things, beautifully painted. I mean, if you're up close to them, it's, it's, it's beautifully made. But the thing he talks about is that there isn't really abstract painting as, as people think of it. It's that, at least in his view, it's just the real world with things extracted. You're taking things out and leaving whatever is left in the painting. And I mean, I could sort of see the trouble you were having with those. I, did, I thought they were beautiful, but the ones where internally you're not feeling resolved if you haven't got something, a body, let's say, in there. But I'm just wondering about your process based on what he's saying, I'm extracting things out until I'm left with this thing, uh, whatever in the painting. But the idea that you're almost starting, it seems like with, you know, you've stripped the world back to this minimalist idea of, of like bodies and, and, and grounds and so on like that. It's not, it seems like a different process. I'm sort of muddling my question here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, have I said something vague enough that you can like, Roll with. <laughs> yeah, I, I I see what you're getting at, Ian. And Ian is a very well known and very accomplished plein air painter. And you know, I've said for years that all painting is abstract, and I'm sure you'll you'll agree that if photographs are abstract, you don't take a photograph of what is in front of your camera. You take a photograph of how you think and how you look at what's in front of your camera. So I think my, maybe we'll talk about centerless paintings. They're just abstracted a couple more steps, but essentially it's uh, giving back something of, of, of what I've internalized. And I think in my case, it's often or usually about nature and giving that back several steps abstracted. I, everybody does this, I think. Poetry is exactly the same thing. You absorb all this stuff and you give it back in words abstracted. And uh, I, I think all artists engage in that process and it comes out different because we're different. Thanks, Bob. I want to also bounce it over to Jamie because I think we get into this kind of a uh, you know, a bit of this philosophical discussion around what is the definition of abstract art and abstraction and there's so many offshoots from this sort of core concept and i imagine you know for everyone we each if you identify as an abstract artist or not bob as you're talking about as an artist in general you might have your own impression of what that is and how that what that how it resonates for you what it means i know that olia and carrie and i have had this sort of ongoing discussion about what is abstract art anyway um we haven't landed i don't know that we will or that it matters but jamie i want to ask what your ask for your thoughts on this and to feel free to jump in well of course implicit in the idea of abstraction is abstracted from which sort of goes to what bob was saying but um it is true that there have been so many movements parsed so many different ways that color field painting can constitute abstraction. Gestural abstraction can constitute abstraction. Uh, geometric abstraction can constitute abstraction. So ad infinitum, I think uh, this is perhaps one of the interesting things about this entire community and the enterprise of trying to bring these people together is that so many different people are approaching it in different modalities, but it still is legitimately abstract. I, I think that answers your question. Thanks for thanks for adding that in, Jamie. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, that's my my personal sense is that you know, and and I we we are trying to create a very inclusive space. So I think that it is an evolving consideration, and I'm interested in hearing how everybody attaches to the idea, and I'm interested in everyone's definition. Um, so anyway. Everyone maybe here is sort of spinning your wheels and thinking. I see some other, uh, we'll move forward. I see some other hands. I'm going to jump over to Fred. And then um, it looks like Aaliyah as well. So Fred, so, go ahead. 
in regard to abstraction, um, like uh, Jamie said, uh, yeah, abstract, abstract from is where that comes from. Uh, I always prefer uh, non-objective and non-representational. It's much more uh, specific. And uh, I think a, a great deal of uh, reductive and, and, and minimal uh, art uh, really is uh, a non-objective art. And uh, I think it's a more accurate description. Joanne, did you have something? I did. Hey, Bob. <laughs> Having seen the evolution of your work over the decades, I'm just blown away by where you are now. I haven't seen this recent work and I just can't tell you how deeply um, I'm responding to it. Oh, my, thank you. My uh, birthday brother here. <laughs> and um, one of the things that really came across in when you, you were talking with Jamie is how deeply your work and of course, this is true for every artist, but how deeply your work is an expression of your lived experience and how well you're able to articulate that. And, and I'm a word person, not a visual person. And so to me, this adds a dimension um, of depth and understanding um, that I really, really appreciate it. You know, that's, thank you, that, that's nice. And I, I know you're a work person and uh, I'm glad if, if this work uh, uh, expresses something um, to people who mostly work with words. Um, and, and I hope it works the other way. I try to understand words and they express something to me. Uh, Fred, I wanted to comment about non-objective and abstract. I would say, and maybe I don't understand the terms or maybe I'm just defining them my way, but my work is not non-objective. My objective is to haul everything I can think of from life, nature, uh, the trees, the dirt underfoot, whatever, and haul it in and put that in the work and then abstract it a few times. I, it's not... Um, and, and maybe it's all semantics, but it's not that I'm making work that isn't about or isn't from something. It is actually from something. Uh, and, and so I would more call it objective work. Does that make sense, Fred? Yeah, I think that's beautifully uh, articulated, especially in regard to your work. Um, and this is, of course, subjective and personal, but for me, um, when I look at my work, uh, uh, when anybody looks at um, what I call uh, non-objective work, I, I think uh, it's a hindrance and a um, distraction uh, for, for viewers who look to imagine what is being referred to. If they, if they look at a, a purely non-representational uh, work and they say, oh, I, you know, I see whatever, a figure there or an animal there or whatever it is, um, I think that that's a disservice to um, uh, some efforts uh, that are trying to go beyond uh, the reference. But again, we're getting into some touchy personal yeah. <laughs> uh, divisions here. What, what, what do you think, Jamie? You want to weigh in on this one? Well, I think even in abstraction, something, something referential is unavoidable. And I, I think that basically has to do with the the sensibility of the, not just the sensibility of the viewer, which can be problematic to our intent, but also the sensibility of the individual. And again, the experience that they bring to it. We're trying to say something with something. Sometimes formal language is, uh, besides being chromatic, maybe about having a sense of order in the universe. I mean, I think there's always some underlying philosophy and narrative 
um, that's really based on the individual and maybe schooled a little bit by tradition, but we're all trying to do or say something meaningful and sometimes in a way that transcends literal reference. I think that's the big draw to abstraction. Thanks so much, Jamie. You're welcome. Um, we might need to have another tech talk where we all get together and just put our definitions of, of abstract art in the mix and see what happens. That would be a fun event. And I think I actually do think that we do that in many ways, many, um, many nuanced ways in general. But uh, let's move forward. I'm going to bounce over to Aaliyah. And then we have a question in the chat next. Um, so also, folks, if you're thinking about questions you might have or things you're struck by, um, feel free to plug them into the chat or raise your virtual hand or just speak up. Um, go ahead, Aaliyah. Um, just wanted to mention my sister, Anya Lita, is also here and my brother-in-law, Zach, and other sure. family members. So it's really fun to see everybody here. It's like a reunion. Um, but I was going to say, Dad, like as long as I've known you, you have always made art. And it's something I'm thinking of as I'm trying to balance life and art. How have you been so successful? And I, I know from talking to you that you sometimes don't feel like you're successful and doing it every day and every week, but you're consistently doing it. If you drop off and go antler hunting, you know, you come back to it. How do you balance all of that? How do you balance your other passions like? being outdoors and then coming back to the studio and it, it's like it's like a long-term goal with you I feel like you know it's it's a it's like meditation it's like a repetition and there's times where maybe you can't get to it but you always come back to it eventually and I feel like you're really successful out of all the people I know how do you find that time and that balance and that that coming back to it how are you so successful in continuing just year after year <laughs> I know you don't feel that way. Feel like, like I've been so successful, but I've, you know, I've always said, and I know I've said it to you and to Francesca and 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 Anya too, that that the only thing I think I've done right is I never let it die. I always kept doing it, and there were years when I couldn't do much because I had small children, high small children. And, uh, it, you know, it takes most of your time. And there was this thing about making money, which uh, was something that, uh, you know, I dealt with buildings and God knows what to try to make some money, different kinds of commercial art. Um, but, but I feel like for all of us, the thing is that the thing that we love to do, whether we can make a living at it or not, that's one thing but we have to keep doing it. Otherwise, well, what are we doing here? And even if you do it like two minutes in, in a day, that keeps it alive, that's all. And so it's still alive. And I, I, if, if I didn't feel like I really wanted to do this, honestly, there's plenty of other things I could be doing. Uh, yeah, enough said. Bob, well, I have to, if you don't mind, I remember in Fairfield when you were driving, you were building and you'd be in your truck and you showed me these drawings. They were about this big and you do them while drawing or while driving. And they were just like scribbles, but there were dozens and dozens of them. Yeah, don't, don't admit that. It, it was well, you weren't you were watching the road. You told me you were watching the road. But. I, well, th there again, it was actually a way to draw without overthinking it. And I would put the tablet next to me and make these little drawings without looking at them. And believe me, I wasn't overthinking them. And funnily enough, I uh, showed them to the museum in Des Moines and uh, I, I showed him 13 of them thinking he might pick a couple if I was lucky. And he picked all 13. So we showed, I showed all, and some were that big, and the biggest ones were about that big. And you may have seen them in, in those days. It was, it was a fun thing, and it proved to me that no matter what I was tangled up with, uh, keep, keep it alive. Keep it alive. Uh, that's all. Thanks, Bob. Um, 
Jamie, did you want to jump in on anything about that sort of how do you sustain the practice over time? Do you want to jump in with anything? Um, there's something else I'd like to ask Bob a little bit later if I can sort of we can uh, come back to that sure I want to get I will I will circle back um, thank you there's a question in the chat and then I think Anya hi Anya um, I will I will bounce over there so the question in the chat Bob is um, this is Ting from Vegas my question to Bob is do you usually finish the painting in one sitting or come back to finish it later as it has many layers but then would the energy later match the previous energy in the same painting uh, Thank you. yes no no yes I it, the, no I never finish it in one almost never in one sitting usually it takes quite a few sittings and one of the things that I've learned is to not try to finish it in one sitting because when I try to do that it often um, you, you just can't do it because of the layer buildup so oftentimes the things that look like I did them like that and then went out to have coffee Actually, I may have come back to, uh, numerous times over numerous days to do that. Uh, you know, we all work out our processes and I'm it, it changes, but yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, Anya, I'll bounce it over to you and then we'll bounce it back to Jamie and see where we land. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, um, the, uh, the question is actually for my husband, Zach, who is part of the family as well. <laughs> hey, Bob. Uh, I had a, I, I was just thinking about something while I was watching the video. Um, and, and then you just touched on it again just now about getting out of your way, getting out of your own way um, that you've mentioned a few times. And so I was just kind of thinking about for you, um, you put a lot of thought um, into your intentions and then you seem to be very uh, focused on wanting to get out of your way once you begin the actual process of doing the work. So it's just kind of curious, um, a few things, but just, yeah, how do you go from setting your intention and then um, just completely almost getting out of the way of the intention or for, do you forget the intention or are you like focused on the intention? Uh, yeah. Where are you in your intern in your internal monologue as you like take up the brush, you're like setting yourself and just feeling where you happen to go or because you're very, again, you're, you're describing ideas and intentions that are very clear. And then the, the process itself feels like almost very gut instinct based spontaneous so just yeah just kind of curious to expand more on uh, the actual act of the work moving from intention to the act i guess yeah that that's a good question Zach. um you know it's a mystery i don't know uh what, what i think on an operational level and i I suppose every other artist here will agree that I feel like I'm, I go into it and out of it and into it and out of it. And when I'm into it, I sort of watch my hand and it seems to do the right thing. And then I come out of it and, and, oh, that isn't right. And blah, blah, blah. And then I go back into it. And it's just, um, I, I, I think everybody kind of works that way, but it, has it, 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 I, I've tried really indirect ways like drawing in the dark and to try to not see what I'm doing at all and honestly it didn't work at all for for me it was just like so random uh, so there's there's something about it that's not random but yet it seems to be kind of uh, you you can't like say well you know, I'm drawing this and then I got to go down here and it, it get all messed up if you do that. It just kind of has to happen. Uh, I, I do think probably all the other artists here experience a little different flavor of that same kind of, and, and you, Zach, writing and Anya writing, you experience it too, don't you? Where you, 
you go in and you understand deeply and then you kind of come out and go, oh, no, I don't get it. And then you go in again. Do you experience that, Zach? Well, I was going to say, I was thinking it's almost like um, directing because except you're directing yourself. You're like the director of the actor because you're giving the intention and the action uh, to yourself and then you're seeing what happens. And then I guess you're reconsidering one, but um, but I'm still curious uh, with the inner Bob monologue while the work is happening. And I guess, because, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, what you're thinking about because um, when, it sounds to me like when you notice you're you're thinking too much is probably I'm guessing when you're telling yourself to step away and reapproach or something is that right or when you're when you're too aware of what you're doing I guess I I don't know I do step back of course and think about it and realize like that painting above Anya's head there has the black body floating in it. And, you know, at some point I thought, hey, I should put a black oval in that spot. And I mean, it's, I, I don't know, it's a confusion of, of going deep and going shallow and the hand and the mind. And honestly, I don't have any very profound thoughts. I just kind of do it. Right. Well, what you're talking about kind of sounds like you're in a flow state, like you're just in a flow and yeah. you're not thinking about what you're doing when you're in it. Yeah, and you must work that way sometimes too, right? I think that's like the ideal state to be in in any art is to be in a flow state where you're not, because the thinking can, I find the thinking can trip you up. Yet you need to think, you need the intellect to do things, but when you're in the middle of it, it's good to get into that state where you're not thinking. Would you say that you're not thinking? When you're just the like what Jamie was saying about the gesture that you're doing is that in place of thinking? I don't know. Um, I I I think I don't understand the process real clearly, uh, but I I know what I'm. I don't know. I just walk in there and and do it, and it. I don't know what I do exactly. I'll, I'll think more about it. What do you think, Jamie? How's your, how do you work? Uh, well, somewhat differently from you, as you know, um, but I was thinking about uh, what Anya just said about flow states. Um, for those of you who don't know the reference, there's a, there's a book by the unpronounceable Mihaly, Six Cent Mihaly, which talks about that creative state, which is a flow state which works universally across any kind of process. I mean, you can be a toy train person and be in a flow state with your toy trains. It's that absolute identification with the moment, the physical material you're working with, where self-consciousness leaves and you're just merged. And that's sort of analogous to meditation. So I think that you can't address these ideas without addressing the idea of some kind of a consciousness practice which can allow you to stop making those kind of sharp distinctions and let you just witness what's being undertaken without the critical evaluation, which is very often a voice, an internalized voice from another source and can be very destructive. So um, I, for myself, and I think Bob, I think this is true for you to some extent. I mean, there are rules and principles that we have applied to the kind of different abstraction that we're doing. So there, there's a framework or a skeleton or, or some guidelines, but ultimately, and this is true of all the abstract painters here too, I think, we're not, we're not making an illustration. We're not making a picture of an idea we're making a thing and um, it's best discovered by having a direct experience of it in the moment and following that moment. So, so to me, the best painting is always that you're in the process of possibly losing something even as you're creating it, but that's the only way you find out what the materials will do. So that's kind of an indirect answer. That's a great answer. 
Both are great answers. Thank you. Yeah. Jamie, did you want to jump in with your, uh, did you state your previous question? Do you want to jump in with something more, something else? I don't want to make, I want to make sure I don't miss, miss your question. Well, I see Mark has his hand raised too, so I don't want to hog the floor. Um, well, go, why don't you go ahead, Jamie, and then I will bounce over to Mark right after that. Well, so this is something that Bob and I have had a lot of conversation external to the to the the filmed discussion. And Bob, there is an idea since we're on the topic of things that are universal to abstract painters and possibly really recognizable to everybody that's on the screen right now or watching this or listening to this. We were talking about the idea of the studio as a private world, which is a laboratory and a refuge and as an extension of the body. And you started to say some really interesting things about that. So I was wondering if you wanted to elaborate on that because it's so relevant. Well, yeah. Um, for me, a studio is, and, and I think we're all like this, maybe I carry it to an extreme, but I like to haul all kinds of stuff in here. I've got rocks and bones and skulls and antlers and Fran's like going, ah, you know, I've got a little bit of everything in here and I don't even look at it mostly, but it's here and somehow it, it feeds me. I, I don't know. I just like, I like the environment and every studio I started out, my friend, Tony Lawler here. Hi, Tony. Tony always had an architectural office that was neat and orderly. And that was always, I was trying to get there, but I never got there. I ended up with this huge mess of, of all this stuff. And it seemed like such a great idea to be orderly like that. And maybe, I, I don't think I'm disorderly, but I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty maximal in that, in that way. And, uh, I guess we all find our 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 environment that works for us. <laughs> well, I just wanted to update you, Bob. Now I work in a complete mess. So. Oh, good, great. I've evolved, <laughs> or, or devolved, as the case may be. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Mark has deferred his question to David's question. Um, so, David, jump in. Hi, David. <laughs> Hi, David going yes i'm just unmuting um thank you thanks mark uh uh my question was about the flow state or my comment um and i think chick sent mahaili talks about two types of creativity small and big c creativity and artists are involved in big c creativity and my interest is in how the two differ and i think we're yes i, I agree that we're all in the flow state while we're making art. But I also think there are thousands of people who are frequently in the flow state who never make great art. So it's a prerequisite, but it's not, um, on its own, it isn't enough. Um, and I'm also interested in the relationship between trance states, meditative states and creative states. But it's very clear to me that people who are great meditators aren't always great artists. Very often they're not, most of them aren't great artists. So the fact that one meditates, one gets into a deeper state, which has in incredible validity, is tangential to being a great artist. And if we think of the biographies of many major abstract artists, they weren't exactly calm, easygoing, uh, level-headed, enlightened people some of them committed suicide some of the greatest some of them had alcohol problems so i'm also interested in for bob as well and i know we've had this talk a little bit about what right if you didn't have if you weren't if you didn't have the history with meditating would your work be different and also can art the practice of art whether abstract or otherwise be its own form of meditation. Th those would be my kind of, they're just issues I'm interested about in. So I'm curious to hear thanks, responses. David. Yeah, thanks so much. 
Also, yeah, I, A plus for pronouncing that name correctly. Oh, yeah, who knows? Um, I no for for me, meditation is one thing that I do, and then I bring that into whatever else I do in life, and I don't get into any meditative state. I I I come into the studio with like thinking about the bills I'm not paying and the you know whatever and it doesn't matter I don't I don't need to to and I I really can't like try to get into some better state or some more uh universal state to do artwork from I just if I and, and again this gets back to what Fred and I were talking back and forth about the idea of of objective and non-objective art i i i i'm totally happy with and encourage dragging everything into the studio that i could think of uh, everything means not everything uh, but but a lot of things and uh so i think my my practice and the way i am when i'm doing art is is totally really totally different than the way I am when I'm meditating. Did did that answer any the question? Thank you. Yeah, it did definitely with regard to your your particular experience. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Mark, go ahead. Um, hi, Bob and Jamie, and thank you guys for a really fun time at the studio. I wanted to, you know, just say this is our i think the fourth one we've done and it's for me it's getting more and more fun every time to get uh you know to be a visitor in all of these creative domains and i'm not a i'm not an artist i'm not a, i'm a musician but it's 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 the equivalent and so um i wanted to uh, i think you kind of touched on the meditations uh, stuff here in your last with the last question, um, one thing I just wanted to to salute you for was the way you were defining success um, by uh, keeping it alive, which I think is a positively enlightened way to look at things, and um, and it resonates with me a great deal. Um, but I also wanted to invite you to share uh, because it didn't make it uh, into the into the video um a little bit more about your history with meditation because it's um it, it it it's quite extensive and if you wanted to um sort of uh, get, uh articulate a little bit more about that i mean some people pick up meditation late in life and some people do it their whole lives and it and from what you told me uh when i was at the studio you know you it has um, it has been a north star in your life. It sounds like uh, so. I'm not sure if that was apparent to everyone, but um, maybe you want to talk about it, and maybe it's uh, maybe not. But anyway, um, thank you both, Jamie and Bob. It was a fun time. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's I started transcendental meditation with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi when I was an older teenager. And before that, I had done some Sufi practices and some uh, Gurdjieff and Uspensky practices. Um, so it, I, I, again, I don't know why I got on this path exactly, but it was something uh, that was very, that has always been very important to me, remains important to me. Uh, I later in life became a, devotee of Amrit Tananda Mai. Uh, and I feel now that I've um, I could say my artwork is my religion, nah, let's leave religion out of it. But I, I just do what I do now. I'm really not uh, I'm not teaching meditation anymore. Uh, I, I often meditate, I sometimes don't. Um, I, I just, I, 
I, I don't know if this, I'm, I just feel like I'm doing whatever I'm doing and here I am and that's what I'm doing. And that, that's about all. I don't make any claims about anything, really. It sounds like you're enlightened fully. Yeah, well, to, to, don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Bob. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, I had a, just an observation that I wanted to offer, and then I want to put some helpful links for everybody in the chat. Um, but this is the first time that we've done a talk talk with two artists in dialogue with one another. And usually it's myself or it's Carrie, um, you know, asking the questions. And um, this is a different way of operating. And so it sparked this question for me, which is really about the artist friendships that we have in our life and what that is, what is it like to have artist friendships and what role do they play in our own identity work and our own practice. I know for myself, it's so um, important to have particularly friendships with other artists who understand what it's like to have a dedicated practice. But I just wanted to offer that to both of you, since obviously you have um, a lovely uh, a lovely rapport and friendship. And what is it like to have artist friendships either with each other or just generally speaking? Jamie? Well, I mean, it's I I feel like those artist friends, particularly those working with related approaches, are the handful of people in your lives that are going to understand what it is you're trying to do. And art making is very personal personal, but to the extent that we respect the way another person works, we can trust their honest feedback in a way that's not destructive. And I think there are times in the studio where that's incredibly valuable. It really is about sharing, recognizing and sharing a, a, a certain order of experience. Thanks, Jimmy. Sure. Yeah, I, yes, that's, that's well said. And I've, I'm just looking at the faces on my screen here, and you guys are my best artist friends, and uh, that crosses over to writers and and uh, uh, cartoonist Francesca, uh, character developers, and uh, and and I really value each friendship, and uh, and that that's very important in in my life, and I. Uh, Sometimes I get wrapped up in my own things and I forget to really reach out and I just isolate myself. Anyway, I'm trying not to. And I've really enjoyed being in the Northern New Mexico art community. I feel very uh, uh, accepted and, and I really like all the people that I'm meeting here. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great place to be and friendship is so important. Thanks, Bob. Um, Thanks, yeah, um, I think we have, well, we're pushing it, but we have time for one more question. I see Tom, your hand raised, and then we'll move into our, our sort of final announcements. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm here. Um, I love seeing your work. I haven't ever seen you know, the history of, of what you do, Robert, but uh, it, it was a wonderful, beautiful, body of work and uh, I just appreciate it's like wow here's this guy who's a really good painter <laughs> he's out there somewhere in my neighborhood you know um and Jamie thank you too um you know uh and I something that I wondered is I kind of might have missed uh, the dating of things um is what's the relationship time-wise between the more minimalist works and the more gestural works or those works that you do simultaneously or are they different periods of of life um yeah tom um thanks for those those comments i've i've seen quite a bit of your work since in your recent shows and uh you're a guy who has done a lot of different things over quite a long time and done them very well 
Um, and and I, for me, it's it gets crossed over. I'm actually doing the most minimal things and maybe the most maximal things all at once. Um, don't we all find that we kind of circle around the same stuff and come back to it over and over? And like I'm just doing a series of work now that's based on some photographs that I did in the uh, uh, 2004, five, and six. Uh, and I always wanted to get back to it, but now I'm actually getting back to it. And uh, it just all circles around. And I, I do allow myself, uh, my, my scientist friend used this expression, mission drift. And I do allow myself some studio drift where I'm working on one thing and then I think, well, maybe I'll put a bone next to that painting over there and and what is, you know, some some drift. But but I like doing a bunch of different things at once and they all are sort of, yeah, they're all related, I think. Don't you think so, Tom? I think yours are all related too. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked because I I drift myself and I it seems like an important part of the process for me. Um, you know, sometimes I just need to move my hand more or, you know, there's there, there's different impulses. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of, when I went to art school, we were all kind of trained to the idea that things were very linear. Um, so you kind of, if you did something else on the side, you kind of hit it, you know. Um, but I think uh, anyway, I, I appreciate seeing, you know, the range of what you've done. And um, yeah, yeah. So thanks. Thanks for the tour. I like, I like to see them in person someday if you're ever up for a, you know, a visit. I'd love to. Um, Anytime, Tom, just let me know and come over and I'd I'll come over and see you too. Sure. That'd be great. That'd be great. Right. And, you know, something, something, you know, actually, I think a lot of interesting points were brought up. I mean, uh, you know, during the course of this, but, um, you know, the meditation as it relates to the studio is an interesting um, thing, if you can call it a thing. It's not really a thing, but, you know, I think for me, I think the way meditation sort of segues with the studio for me uh, is that, you um, it's like learning to discern um, what's necessary regarding thinking and what's not. You know, it's a way of, uh, for me, of, of um, God, I, I, I thought of it before. I don't know how to say it now, but um, uh, it's like making decisions in the studio and where do those decisions come from? You know, in a way, meditation sort of unpacks the relationship with thoughts for me. Um, and what's true and what's not true and what might be necessary and letting things kind of move, move, come into being, disappear. Um, and in a way, it's it sort of brings me to a deeper questioning of the decisions I make in the studio or what I feel and where those things actually come from. Um, I'm not quite saying what I think I want to say. <laughs> and I think in part, I'm not sure what I want to say, but it's something in that nebulous cloud of words is something something like that um sounds like the beginning of a very enjoyable studio visit between the two of you <laughs> yeah I, I look forward to it thank you so much tom um i want to uh just we're at that we're a little bit over time but i think you know everyone is here and so so delight uh so delightful in terms of your questions and engagement. So thank you, everyone. Um, Robert, Jamie, thank you for having this conversation and inviting us into that. And um, want to allow you know allow you two to or invite you rather to share any last remarks you'd like to sh uh, bring to our group here. And then I'll put a few links in the chat. May I? May I give a quick? plug to Bob's imminent open studio event with Tim yes. Nero. Please, Bob. I know, I just, I saw that in the chat as well. Well, um, can we have some details about that, Bob? You have something coming up? Sure, uh, Tim Nero, who a lot of you know, and uh, he and I have decided we're gonna do for ourselves what nobody else is doing for us and show all the little stuff 
that we love that we've been doing over the years. Some of it's like, you know, important little stuff. Some of it's like weird little things that are that big. We're going to pack this studio. We're going to do it here at my studio. Pack this place with uh, hundreds of, of pieces of work that's small and some of it not so small. And uh, we're going to have a big opening on Saturday, June 17th. And uh, I'll, I'll put out information and details, but I hope you all that are local could come. And, uh, uh, it, you know, we're going we're gonna to really have fun with this and do it in a way that we wouldn't do a gallery show. It's going to be our, just our own stuff. That sounds great. Please tell us and we will post uh, we'll post that Thank and spread you. the word. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm putting some links in the chat box right now um, for folks to tune in to other Tac Talks. Here's our YouTube channel. Also, Bob's website, Jamie's website. And I'd like to also um, let everybody know that Again, thank you to Mark. We're really fortunate to, that Mark brings his videography, directing, editing skills to the table here. Um, Mark is interested and available to do artist profiles and other independent projects. You can check out his work at this link, marksmithvideo.com. Um, and if other folks have anything you'd like to announce at this time, any upcoming shows, please feel free to put that in the chat or, or say it out loud. And, um, and we are always glad at TAC to spread the word and share information about upcoming shows that people have. We do our best to know what's happening in Northern New Mexico. It's a lot. Um, so please help us out. Let us know. And we're always glad to, to share on social media and include in our newsletter. Um, so does anyone want to share anything out or put anything in the chat? Any upcoming shows you have going on? I know we have so many artists in the room here. We welcome shameless plugs. Okay. If not, just email us um, at Taos Abstract Artist Collective at gmail.com. And um, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jamie. It's been really wonderful. Thanks all of you for tuning in and your great questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, we look forward to future TAC Talks. Our upcoming talks are with C. Marquez and Clark Stokely. Those will be coming up later on this uh, late spring and summer. So. Thank you, everybody, and have a good, peaceful rest of your Sunday evening. Thank you, Bob. Thanks.